Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Andrew Ashman. I'm from Barclays Bank based here in Singapore and I'm also the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the British Chamber of Commerce in, in Singapore and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar Against the Odds Achieving Success with Singapore's Paralympian Athletes. Disability is a key pillar of the work that we do in the DNI committee at BritChamp, particularly around normalizing and removing unconscious bias around the range of abilities. So I'm really delighted to be to be hosting um, today's event and we, we've got some fantastic speakers uh, to, to share their, their views with you. In today's session, we'll be discussing some of the challenges uh, performing at elite levels of international sport. We'll be discussing some of the challenges of doing that as a, as a disabled athlete. And we'll also be talking about resilience and mental health. Um, we'll touch on coaching and ways of getting the best out of people and your teammates. And we'll also be talking about unconscious bias and the importance of normalizing disability um, and promoting a, a wide range of abilities in today's society. We, we have a couple of housekeeping uh, before housekeeping comments before we start. Um, this is an interactive session. There is a, a Q&A box in your Zoom screen. So if you do have a question you'd like to put to the speakers, please do enter your, your Q&A in that box and, and we'll do our best to, to address all the questions that come through. Um, I'd first like to introduce our, our speakers today. Um, and first up, we have Theresa Go. Theresa is a queer Paralympian swimmer from Singapore. She represented her country internationally for 20 years before retiring in 2019. Teresa held the world record in the 50 and 200 meter breaststroke SP4 category and won a bronze medal in the 100 meter breaststroke SP4 category at the Rio Paralympic Games. She's also an advocate of LGBTQ rights in Singapore and strongly believes in the importance of seeing the ability in a person without erasing their disability. Welcome to Teresa. We, we also have Yip Pin Chui. Uh, Yip Pin Chui is a, a Singaporean backstroke swimmer and is the country's most decorated Olympic athlete. She's a five time Paralympic gold medalist and holds two world records in the 50 and 100 meter S2 category. She's also a former member of parliament in Singapore and currently serves on the athlete committee of the world anti-doping agency. Welcome Pin Chui to today's conversation. And last but not least, we, we have Tim Newnham. Tim uh, completed his undergraduate and graduate studies at Loughborough University and became an international athlete in the javelin and bobsleigh events. Tim's professional leadership appointments have included the GB national coach, and he's also a personal coach to disabled athletes and able-bodied athletes alike. Apart from being based in the UK, Tim also worked in Saudi Arabia, in Malaysia and Oman before commencing as performance and pathway di director with the Singapore Disability Sports Council, where he focuses on para sports. Tim has a passion in helping people unlock their potential, both in sport and through sport. So welcome, Tim, to today's conversation. Welcome to all our, our panelists. Maybe I'd, I'd like to just kick the, the conversation off and, and start the conversation and, and talk to, to Teresa and Pink Tree just to understand a little bit how you got involved in elite sport. What, what really drew you to, to sport in, in, in the first place? And maybe I'll start with Teresa uh, with, with that question. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for having me here. Um, what, 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 what got me started? I think it was something as simple as wanting my parents wanting me to um, be more active. <laughs> That's it, you know. I think <laughs> as a as a as a disabled child, um, back in the eighties, seven, you know, I think my my parents wanted to make sure that opportunities were provided for me that were not naturally provided. Um, so they made sure that they sought out um, rehab, uh, exercise, physio stuff like that that would help me be then more independent. So I think. The ultimate goal was to be more independent. Um, it became more sessions in the pool for fun. Um, and before, like we, we did, never really had the, 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 the desire or the real goal to be competitive, not really. 
um, it really just happened that way. Um, it was, I think, in 99 or 98, 98 when I was uh, swimming in a pool with my dad. And uh, there was a volunteer from the Singapore Disability Sports Council. Uh, where I work now <laughs> with Tim um, and and he came up to me and my dad and basically my dad and told him you know I think she has a lot of potential you know do you want to bring her to an upcoming national games um, just to see you know just to just to have a look uh, and that really kick-started a lot of uh, kick-started my journey basically <laughs> And, and 20 years of like not looking back. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. We're, we're so impressed with your, your career and your performance. And, 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 and Pintry, is, is, is that similar so for you? Did, did you kind of get into support sport as a, as a way of kind of getting active and, 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 and getting experiences outside of, outside of your home? Um, I, I think for me, it's a little bit different. Um, the journey is a bit similar, but the reason I got started was different. So I started when I was six years old, and that's because I had uh, two elder brothers who were already swimming. So when they swam, and then I would play by myself in the baby pool. And after a while, I got really bored playing alone. But I remember it was just a watering can, fill it with water, water the swimming pool. It was really boring after a while. <laughs> so I asked my mom if I could join my brothers to learn swimming. And uh, she asked the coach. And at that point in time, I was really, really fortunate because I think even till today, many coaches in Singapore, they are not confident with teaching people with disabilities. But at that point in time, I was lucky because the coach that was taking my brother had um, experience with another swimmer who was an amputee, who was uh, coincidentally already on the national team at that point in time. So with this experience, she was... Uh, wasn't afraid of trying to help me to learn swimming, get confident in the water. And that's how I started. Uh, every Sunday uh, at 9 a.m., I would be at the swimming pool. I had this nice uh, golden brown tan, which I no longer have because I'm spoiled by the indoor pool at the aquatic uh, center. <laughs> uh, and, um, and when I was 12, I was also spotted by a volunteer from the Singapore Disability Sports Council. Uh, back then, it wasn't widely known that people with disabilities could do sports. Um, I saw Teresa in the papers uh, right before uh, I joined the team and then I, I was interested because at that point in time, there was very little representation about disability. So I, I really felt like I was the only one who was disabled. Everybody else around me didn't have a disability and I felt very out of place. So I think it's really important that we have uh, representation now as well as um, for people to see what is possible. Yeah. It, it, it sounds for both of you, it sounds like you, you feel it was a bit of luck that you got into sport and, and competitive uh, swimming um, and you may be talent spotted by, by lucky, by chance, by, by people. Is, 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 is that the case? And is that still the case in, in Singapore? Um, I, I would like to think that we have a lot more opportunities now because yeah. because of um, media and everything, people know that it is possible. Uh, well, being spotted is luck, but everything else after that was your hard work. <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Yeah. And, and, I think it was uh, both, both. And also just, I think my parents definitely played a huge part of it. Um, you know, they, they definitely were the ones who kind of built that foundation for me, uh, interested in the pool. I love the pool from the very beginning, just because of the feeling I get in the water, you know, um, that, that feeling of freedom and uh, no boundaries and, and stuff like that. Like, I think I, I got that because my parents were the ones who introduced me to that, that world uh, in the first place. Yeah, I, I think so you, it's yeah. generally very important to have a good support system. Like if my dad didn't send me for morning training for in, in my growing up years, I would never have made it. Right. Like I wouldn't wake up at 5 a.m. Same, same. <laughs> my dad my dad would wake up at like 5 30 to go jog around the swimming pool and just so he can send me to the pool to train. Uh, and if he like if sometimes I wake up and he's not awake, I'll be like, I'm gonna go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> But if he's awake, I have to go, right? <laughs> That's right. So you're, you're you were complaining then, but you are you're quite thankful now, I'm sure, 
for your for all the support that your family family gave you. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. And as, as you kind of got to the to the early stages of of your career, what what were kind of the differences you, you felt as a disabled athlete? What what were some of the barriers that you you had to to break down uh, as as disabled athletes that maybe able bodied didn't didn't have the same um, same issues with. Teresa, you go first because you started earlier. Yes. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> you started five years before me. Okay. Um, I mean, I think I was like I, I attribute a lot of it to luck and a little bit of privilege. So I had a lot of uh, opportunities. I was able to be the first in a few of the things like um, uh, I got to experience, I think I just got a lot of doors open for me, you know, not to say that they weren't uh, wor- like worth or worthwhile. <laughs> like I think I definitely worked hard to get to where I, I got, but I think there were a lot of opportunities that were open for me uh, and I was there at the right time. So. Um, there were experiences that I faced the before and after of. So when I started, we didn't have um, like what do you call it combined uh, flag presentations. So when we go f- when we leave for games, there's um, C games, ASEAN Para games. Uh, they and they 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 had separate flag presentations at the start, like you know, and it didn't make sense right. because they were essentially in the same location. It was just one after the other. So. When they finally made the decision to combine it, uh, it firstly made sense. Secondly, it was good for the whole sporting um, environment, you know, to yeah. know when, when able bodied athletes and disabled athletes are able to kind of mingle and know that both sides exist, of course, um, being able to be around each other, representation as one, you know, I think that was really important. Um, I think also when I I was when I just started, I think the disability sports news uh, always ended up in the home section, um, not in the sports section. Which right. at that point, you know, in time to me, I was like, all I did was, oh, I, I'm in the papers. <laughs> <Then I just laughs> think of the consequence of not being in the sports section, which was of course uh, detrimental to disability sports, right? So when they finally made the shift to put us in the, the sports section and I was like, oh, wait, this makes more sense. <laughs> you know, and it's all, I think, um, proactiveness from from people who are in directly uh, involved in disability sports, but also people behind the scenes, you know. Um, I imagine there were many conversations that were had to make sure that that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and did you lobby, did you lobby for that change as well? And for example, in the media? Um, I I was oblivious to be honest. I'll be honest. I, I had yeah. no idea that this was bad for us. <laughs> all, all I was all all I was focused on was training. You know, I wanted to. I had what eleven sessions a, a, a week, thirteen sessions a week. You know, I did not really have time to do anything. To think else. about yeah yeah, yeah. and, and so, it was all behind the scenes. Mm, definitely yeah. yeah. I, I have this thing where I laugh through pain, you know, so like at training, we're just <laughs> laughing a lot because laughing through pain. And then when Teresa mentioned that 11, 13 sessions, my mind just immediately went like, ah, like, oh, that was interesting. <laughs> That's something we'll touch about. I think I think we'll touch on that a bit later when we talk about mental health and, and how you you build resilience as a as an elite sporting person so we'll, we'll definitely cover that thing to later on but I'm, I'm kind of keen to, to kind of hear about your early stages and, and some of the challenges that you, you felt you faced yep so I think that uh, Singapore yeah. is actually a very meritocratic society so at that point in time we were at the point in time when I came in um, it was in 2005 2004 2004 actually yeah. Terita was going for her first Paralympics in Athens um, I just joined the team and uh, I was really training up for a major games. So at, at a point in time, um, what, okay, on hindsight, I didn't know, I on hindsight, then I knew that a lot of people were actually fighting for the para-athletes and the able-bodied athletes to receive the same amount of grant, uh, to receive the same amount of support from the government. And uh, they could use our results as a way of getting eventually getting there by proving that um, these uh, the, these para athletes are winning. They're doing certain things, and and they deserve they deserve the same kind of respect 
and and things like that. So that really started out um back in maybe two thousand and two thousands in the two thousands. Then only in I think after Beijing two thousand and eight, uh, when we won a couple of medals at the Paralympics, then it became a a big a bigger thing in Singapore, whereby where people were trying to um the the public. So at, at that point in time, uh, we had prize monies. But the prize monies were ten percent of what the Olympians would get. Yeah. And then eventually, um, the public really fought for us, uh, things like that. And then eventually, it raised up to twenty percent. It was only this year where it became um forty percent. So I think the disparity is getting smaller. Um, the government recognizes that we are the same. We should be treated the same. I think it's now eventually trickled down to the corporates and the public. To try to give the same kind of support to para athletes as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's key. It, it sounds like you you were encouraged to to do the swimming and do the hard work, and and your, your supporters were were really doing the political lobbying and and working with with the media to to improve the visibility of the sport. And then and then you kind of uh, I'm I'm keen to understand a little bit more as you got into the into the Olympics and, and the Paralympic Games. What what were some of the challenges you 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 found as you were an elite athlete and, and really performing at gold medal standard and, and winning world records? What, what what kind of what were some of the things that you, you really had to overcome at, at that point? I personally felt that whatever we had to overcome was pretty much what an able body athlete had to overcome. Yeah, it was basically like we used to say the hardest thing about being an athlete is waking up at five a.m. in the morning. Really, like once we got past that, the day was okay. And I think as a sixteen, <laughs> I had so much more energy than I do now. <laughs> you know, the recovery rate is so much higher and things like that. So yeah. on my side, things don't they, they didn't feel that bad. Um, the challenge was really like balancing maybe my studies and 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 sport because it is uncommon in Singapore. Like I I think in America it's common when people do the NCAA's and things like that, but. In Singapore, it's really uncommon that uh, we try to balance sports at an elite level as well as studies or work and things yeah. like that. And I think because of this, it is harder for Singaporeans um, to 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 get to a higher stage. Yeah, there yeah, there are a lot the, of sacrifices. Yeah, so it's it's the support network and being able to balance your your, your bigger life with with. with the training and the time required to, to to get to the level that that you need to. And Teresa, was that the same for you? You were a couple of years ahead. Were you uh, were you, you were trailblazing the <laughs> the whole cause? Yeah, the five years didn't give me any ease on the difficulty. <laughs> um, it was yeah. I mean, I would I would echo that sentiment. The five a.m. was brutal. Like five a.m. is just the worst part because um, I'm not. I would I would. I'll be the first to admit I'm not a perfect athlete. You know, I I have trouble sticking to good sleeping habits, <laughs> and yeah. sometimes you know it ends up being I don't know like a certain time, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I have I have so little time to sleep. But you wake up, you do it, and then you I'm I'm lucky I have time after that to nap a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, I mean the the struggles I think we face um. Would, would probably be a little bit different from some other of the uh, disabled athletes in other sports, I think. Um, I only recently realized just how lucky we are to have so much funding <laughs> on swimming side. Um, you know, swimming has done well and have received like uh, the necessary funding needed to support our, our sport, right? But I think there's, um, there's, there's a whole ecosystem and structure in Singapore where if you don't do well, you don't get support. So I think that's that's really harmful for sport in general. Just cause it's like a chicken and egg. Where do you start? Yeah. Do you give the support first, or do you wait till they achieve something, which can be very hard sometimes, you know? Um, yeah. So I think for us as swimmers, like we've we've been honestly really lucky, <laughs> and and I think we've um, the challenges we face are the same as the able-bodied swimmers, you know. Yeah. 5 a.m. 5 a.m. wake up times. I don't <laughs> <laughs> but you've obviously done very well and, and it's been an amazing journey for, for you both to, to, to put all that hard work in and, and get to where you are. So very, very good. Congratulations. Um, maybe moving on to Tim. 
tell us about your story. How did you arrive in Singapore? Yeah, I've, I've been hired by different countries over the years to help their performance systems. So often, as you've heard with our two athletes here, a, a country has uh, some success from individuals or some individual sports and they want to expand that. So I've worked in different countries, as you've said, and I arrived in Singapore to start my contract here, actually, on the 1st of December. And uh, the first thing I did was to was to listen and understand the ecosystem here. So people like Ping Chu, people like Teresa, you know, have been very, very helpful to me so that I can get a head start. So the first thing was to listen and understand. The second, once I did that, was to hire, uh, we've actually got four new members of staff, Teresa included, all of whom have a, a strong background in sport and understanding what it takes to perform. So my role now is to help the pathway through for more people to do exactly what these two guests have done. And we want to extend a little bit into other sports uh, beyond swimming, which has been hugely successful. But now we've got an offering of uh, more services, things like sports science, things like the programming and the planning uh, to make sure that the athletes with potential and have, who have the desire to succeed you know, have those have those tools, if you like, in the toolbox. So it's um, a real privilege to be here and a real joy to be in Singapore. Um, I've noticed one difference, uh, and that is that worldwide, there's on average about 15% of the population has, has disabilities, okay? In Singapore, the figures looks like 3%. There's a number of reasons for that, but the knock-on effect is that there isn't the exposure that perhaps other countries get to people with disabilities. So it isn't necessarily normalized yet. Perhaps people haven't come across people with disabilities in the same way as other countries. So that would be one observation. And one of the things that I'm quite keen to do is to, is to increase the exposure, increase the normality, extend, for instance, the number of coaches who currently coach able-bodied athletes in different sports to extend their coaching practice into disability sport or para sport, as we call it. And it really isn't that different. I coach javelin, that's my sport. And that's about speed of release. Everything is about how fast you can release the javelin. So it doesn't matter if you're six foot four of muscle or you're a wheelchair user or you're an amputee and you have a prosthetic leg, it doesn't matter. It's still about the speed of release. So you start from the end result of what you want to achieve. And then it's just an extension of the person's ability into how you're going to achieve it. And I think with that mindset, I think it's, we can excite more coaches and more people who wish to volunteer to coach and support and entice them into the world of parasport because it's such a good opportunity to bring the best out of people. So that would be my observation right now. Fantastic. And as, as, a, as a coach, clearly you, you, have, a, you have to drive your, your athletes with a, a relentless training programme. We, we've heard about the 5 a.m. starts and... How do you how do you actually push your your athletes to to get the best out of them? What what are some of the pieces of advice you can give to us as as general members of the public who are working with teams, maybe um, in terms of getting the best out of out of their people? Well, individualize it. You've got to know the individual. What makes someone tick, and then once you know what makes them tick, then you can really get going. So it isn't one size fits all. It isn't one technique, one way of doing it. Once you know who you're dealing with, you know what motivates. Um, you can really shape, I think, and build on people's natural ability to be better tomorrow than they are today. Uh, sometimes it's, it's fairly tough. The 5 a.m. starts for swimmers is, is legendary. I think there's a few sports that have this early start and swimming is one of them. Other sports, not so much. But again, in Singapore, there is a difference uh, because of the temperature and humidity. Uh, sports tend to start early if they're out, outside, tend to have evening sessions rather than midday even with full-time, you know, athletes who are able to do that. Whereas perhaps in the UK and other parts of Europe, Australia, it's possible during certain times of the year to, to vary that training time. So that's another difference to do with climate and humidity. But um, no, individualize it uh, and make sure that, I, I believe, make sure that athletes become independent learners as well. It switches from telling if you like or instructing it switches over to a conversation where you're asking the athlete what they see so that you can tune into the level of understanding and then you can guide so it becomes a different dialogue it becomes creating independent learners um, independent competitors because 
as a coach, you're not always there at every competition. So you have to make sure that each of the athletes you're working with are quite capable of working out what's happening in a competition, tactically, technically, to improve if, if the coach isn't there. Sometimes they're split across different athletes and different events. So I, that would be my advice. And, and I think the same advice would go to anyone who's helping people to learn and improve. I'm, I've just seen a, a question come in, Tim, about diet diets and the importance of, of eating well and do, how, how important is, is a dietitian in, in the, um, in the training program? Do, do you work with them in, in, in your team? Yeah, I'll just mention first and then they can explain their experiences. So my job now is as director is to coordinate these services, to get these services working together, whether it's strength and conditioning, biomechanics, could be underwater filming, could be physiotherapy and sports nutrition uh, is another of those factors so at very simple level the energy into your body if it's matching the energy expenditure your body weight's going to stay the same but with athletes you need a certain amount of muscle mass you want to improve the recovery time so you, you're ready for the next session being the kind coaches that we all are we want the athlete to be fully recovered and then we can get in another session um, so um, good good nutrition habits are really key and, uh, and I think advice is readily available as well now. It's quite widely known and quite readily available. I'll hand over to, to, uh, to Ping Xu and, and, and Teresa to just see from their perspective. You can go first, yes. Right. <laughs> so we do have a team of sport scientists that we have, so we have, we have called the dream team. Um, and in this dream team, there's definitely the coach um, a dietitian, a psychologist, physiotherapist, strength and conditioning coach, biomechanist. Um, have I mentioned physiologists? But okay, there's basically a team of people that surround us. And we all have the same goal in mind, which is to, even though at the end of the day, I'm, I may be the only one getting the medals, but the team's goal is basically to get the athlete at the top uh, using all of the physiological gains, training gains, as well as we find marginal gains wherever we can. So a dietitian is very important uh, because it is really helpful in terms of like being able to find the energy, being able to recover really fast for the next race. So like just this weekend, I had six races and as a 30 year old, that is a lot of races to be swimming over a weekend. <laughs> So yeah, it was really about um, being able to recover on time with, with my food and, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, it. Yeah. I, it's I, been I the same for you, yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty similar. <laughs> yeah. But I think with every with everything, whether it's coaching, uh, physiology or biomechanics, even nutrition has to be, of course, customized. So for like we have this thing where we did uh was it a basal met metabolic uh testing so we basically don't move and they measure the energy output um based on your body so if you have usually if you have a higher body muscle mass you tend to burn a bit faster and more um just because the muscle needs to like it burns more and faster right so then you need to in intake uh, a little bit more than somebody who doesn't have as much muscle mass, for example. Um, so that was something that our dietitian did with us, uh, just to know what our daily intake should be. Um, and then because, like, it's also sometimes people react differently to, to carbs and protein. So that's also all that. Uh, it's, it's almost trial and error with everything that we do. Um, not everything is uh, plug and play, right? <laughs> I, I know a lot of coaches, people wish that they could be because, you know, it takes a lot of uh, challenges away. But um, it's a lot of trial and error, a lot of testing, a lot of knowing yourself. Um, and, and it all works together, you know, like she's like KX mentioned, it's, it's a dream team because you all have to work together. You have to communicate with one another. The, the coach has to talk to the dietitian, the strength conditioning. Everyone has to know what we're doing because if one thing is out of place, it could mess up the whole thing, you know? Um, yeah, so we definitely work with a dietitian. I, I think there are teams that haven't gotten to the point where they um, make use of every sport science they have in their, you know, in their, their kind of toolkit. Um, but they should, because I think when you get to a stage of high performance, you're really trying to find the interest in your uh, 
um, your your results. And and Teresa, we, we we've heard from from Tim and the the importance of having a a support network through all these experts that that you you mentioned. But just fundamentally, what 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 were some of the lessons that that the coaches have taught you generally in in, in life? What are some of the takeaways that the coaches have have, have given you? Um. I've had a lot of coaches over the years. <laughs> um, yeah. When I was just starting with SDSC as a young athlete, um, I had, I think, and, and at that time, the, the, the kind of the environment of coaching in Singapore with disability sport was very different. We had volunteer coaches. We didn't really have hired coaches. Um, so at one time, I could have seven volunteer coaches, one for each day almost, you know. Um, yeah. And that was not great because you get confused, you get uh, different instructions coming in, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still definitely grateful to every one of them because they've all contributed to the athlete that I become, you know. Um, but over the years, the one, there's a few things that, that, that stick with me, right. Um, I think the one thing that I remember uh, is one, when my coach, uh, uh, Uncle Seong or Ang Ping Seong um, told me one of the in one of the competitions, you know, to let go. And and I'm known to be a very anxious competitor. Like I get I get all in my head, and I think that also is very detrimental to my um, my performance, definitely. So as I've learned, and I think Tim mentioned uh, intelligent athletes. You know, you wanna teach them how to be independent. You don't, you don't want them to become robots and just follow instructions, which is which is, which is maybe easier sometimes, but it's not a long-term solution. So for me, I had to learn to be an independent athlete and uh, learn to use um, like learn to use my brains in swimming, <laughs> which I always thought I didn't have to. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was it was only later on where I realized, you know, I need to know what I'm doing, why I'm doing this. I need to want to do this. So changing that whole mindset of doing it just for the sake of doing it was just not cutting it anymore. Yeah. I had to yeah. want to do what I'm doing um, and, and know that this is the, the path I've chosen and to do it well, you know? Yeah. No, it's, a, it's a fantastic lesson for life, I think, for, for all of us it is... Yeah, we, we, we if we want to do something well and at the, the top of our, our level, we, we have to really enjoy it and be completely bought into it. So it's it's something we should all be be thinking about in everything that we, we try to do. And 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 Peng Chui, is, is it, what 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 did your coaches kind of teach you as you as you went through your career? What was the kind of takeaway for for you? Well, I I think there are many takeaways, but um recently uh perhaps this, this one is on top of my mind because I was having a conversation with, uh, with a friend. Uh, one, one of my coaches told me when I was really, really young that regardless of whether I win or I lose, the responsibility is mine. So I don't get to blame my coaches. I don't get to blame my teammates. I don't get to blame my parents or anything. It is all my responsibility. So knowing that at a young age really taught me about ownership. It gave me this um, sense that if I felt that something was wrong, something that uh, something I wanted to change in training or, or in, in my environment around me, I would have to be the one to do it. I couldn't just sit there and wait for things to happen. So I think even till today, um, I still carry that really close to my heart uh, amongst all the other advice from many, many good coaches. But uh, this is just one thing that's on the top of my mind right now. Mm -hmm. Nice. Amazing. So you, you own the results, you, you take responsibility for it. That's that's the key kind of learning from, from your, your coaching is it's 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 all your own responsibility and we can't blame others for, for an outcome. Again, I think it's an amazing lesson for our, our own lives as we try and achieve our own our own goals. And and the, the next area I wanted to, to move on to was was mental health and Mental health for us in, in the Diversity and Inclusion Committee has been a, a huge topic, particularly through COVID, where there's so much external stress, um, so much uncertainty and, and change. I, I, I imagine both of you performing at the high levels that you do, you, you put yourselves under huge amounts of personal pressure. Um, you, you have to deal with performance issues when things don't go your way. How, how do you how how do you maintain motivation? How how do you keep a, 
a positive mindset and, and build resilience when you're when you're training is there anything you can share to to, to help all of us um to get through uh, our own our own stresses and, and improve our own mental health Teresa, um, you go. Okay. <laughs> just like a tag you're it um <laughs> I, I i think I'm, i've been really um lucky also to have uh, the, the opportunity to have worked with some great uh, sports psychologists um, I think they've been helpful in setting the pace on how on, on my mental strength. Like I, I feel like right now I have uh, a combination of the years and years of mental health, uh, mental strength practice, basically. Um, and it's it's something that you don't notice straight away, and it's a daily, long term work, work. You know, um, it's it's something as simple as noticing when uh, a negative thought enters your head um, and being able to catch it that as simple as that so you once you catch it you are able to kind of stop and and reframe so this is it's it's not easy at the start you know because it's just something you're not used to and it's like training you have to train to get better at it um i i think it's it's a progression so you start from that you start from catching it you start from catching it to being able to stop it to being able to push it out of your head to be able to being able to keep it out of your head um and it's it's progression like i think with uh, everything i i do think also the people that you surround yourself with also matters so when you get when you are surrounded by negative um, words people environment that's going to affect you uh, how much it affects you is also up to you but it will definitely play a role, you know. Um, so yeah, I think definitely choose the people you want to surround yourself with. Um, but also the most important is work on yourself because that's the one you can control, right? <laughs> you can't control whether yeah. people say negative things or bad things, but you can control how much you are affected by it. So I think the number one thing for me is to work on self, um, to be able to catch negative thoughts or to be able to work on yourself, on your own mental strength, yeah. Oh, fantastic advice! Yeah, it's something that, that I'll certainly take away. That's that's very, that's very useful. And 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 Pentry, is it the same to you? Um, definitely, you... definitely those three points. And and I I really resonate with the last one. I I mean the first two is like natural, yeah. more, a bit more natural for me. But the last one was really tough, especially in my growing up years. Um, I was afraid to speak to the media growing up. Um, I was affected by what people say but I think it also took me many years to realize that this is my life I will live it the way I want to and I cannot really control what other people say or how they how they judge me or things like that so really it's gotten to this point where I can look at uh, comments on Facebook the good ones are fantastic the negative ones are a bit like meh but I can just ignore them it wouldn't affect me anymore but it took like many, many years of practice of, of reinforcing myself that this is my life and the way I want to live it. And I'm having a fantastic life. Um, as long as I'm okay with my actions and, and know the consequences, then I can I can make peace with it. But what, whatever people say, I just have to ignore it. And um, one other thing that I have found to be really, really helpful for me uh, was that when I was younger, I kept a journal that like was my gratitude journal so every day i would write something i was um uh that that, that i found uh, was really good about my day and it could be anything so i i think by keeping a gratitude journal it really helped me to uh, be a more be a person that was a lot more positive because when there are so many good things happening in your life you will generally be less negative and now it's gotten to this point where I don't have to keep a journal, but I'm just grateful about a lot of things every day. Yeah. Fantastic. And it's an amazing message for all of us. I think that's a, that's a great piece of advice. Thank you for that. And, and, and Tim, as a coach, what, what's, your, what's your perspective? What, what do you yeah. see from, from the athletes? And, and <coughs> so I'm going to recommend, I'm, I'm first, first of all, I'm going to recommend a book. Um, it's also down as a podcast. Um, and it's, it's by Professor Stephen Peters. He's a clinical forensic psychiatrist, <clears throat> not a sports psychologist, but he became one, who's based in the UK. Uh, and he, uh, he wrote a book called The Chimp Paradox. 
And it's about this little voice in your head sometimes saying to saying you're not good enough. A little voice saying you shouldn't really be here competing. You don't deserve to be with these top athletes. A little voice in your head saying you really should have done extra training. You know, this this doubt that suddenly appears. And when you doubt yourself, it can lead to huge stress. So I can recommend it. Have a read. Have a listen. Professor Stephen Peters, The Chimp Paradox. He frames how your brain works, the limbic system, how it works in a, in a lovely way of visualizing it. But what you, you've heard from two top athletes, what they've said is absolutely right. It is about controlling the controllables. Easy to say, hard to do. But one, one thing you can't do is control everything around you. You can't control what people do or say, but you can at all times control your attitude to that. So you're totally in control of how you react to things. And you've heard some of the techniques that are used. And as a coach and as a director and managing people, it's really important that we do look after people's mental health. We do recognize when people are stressed. We encourage people to speak up. So you're never alone. Other people are going through stress at different times. They might hide it very well, but it's guaranteed that someone in your organization, someone in your school, your college, or your competition team will be in a stressful situation. They'll require all the resilience they have. So when it's your turn, and it will be at some point, do talk to people. You're not alone. Others will go through it as well. Change your environment. Step outside. If you're sitting staring at a screen and not making any progress in an hour and your head is spinning, change your environment. Singapore is ideal for stepping outside. Step outside, change your environment. Change it. And you can start to read up on some of the techniques that you've heard of uh, and, and do talk about it to your, to your close friends. Don't keep it to yourself. Um, we do work with sports psychologists. We work with uh, Athlete Life, which is Sports Singapore, who provide people who can help to uh, help athletes organize their life. Maybe they're at school, have to balance exams, as you've heard, or maybe it's a job that they have to balance and train. So they work closely with sports psychologists and as we said earlier, it's all about giving the skills, giving more tools for the toolbox to, to the athletes to be independent, independent learners, independent thinkers. So they have to perform under pressure. They have to perform at the very best. That's what they want to do at the very moment that counts. That's a lot of pressure. And pressure comes usually from the, your own expectations and expectations of others. But if you can recognize that and have some of these techniques that you practice when you're not stressed, then you can employ them when you are. And I think the world of sport can be very useful, uh, particularly high performance sport, to provide extra tools for the toolbox for other people uh, in school, ready for exams, colleges, even in work with difficult conversations and difficult decisions. So many of the things that we've learned can transcend and move across into other worlds. Yeah. Fantastic advice, I think, from, from all three of you on on very important topic that's facing us all at the moment. So thank you for, for sharing, everyone. Um, I've just been given a note that we've got about 10 minutes left and we'll, we will have a, a Q&A session at the end of the uh, the conversation. So please do put your Q&A into the, the Q&A box and we'll address those at, at the end of the, the conversation. Um, but just moving on to another topic and and this is really for, for Teresa and 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 one of the, the key um, discussion points we have in the diversity and inclusion committee is is intersectionality uh, and multiple identities across different dynamics and uh, I know Teresa you you straddle many different labels across disabled queer and and female as a, as a woman what what are some of the the differences you see and what's some of the advice um, to, to, to the to the audience on how you um, manage your, your experiences across the three three different labels or, or more? Yeah, I mean, the term intersectionality never really came into discussion until I think much re recently. I think people sometimes struggle with understanding that a uh, disabled person can be queer, a queer person can be um, disabled, like, like vice versa. <laughs> I think sometimes people just struggle with the idea of labels, right? Because there's just so many these days. Um, I think for me personally, there have been obviously, I think, moments where I feel like people are more willing to accept um, part of myself. They, they're more willing to embrace my disabled 
Paralympian side compared to my queer side. I think especially when you come to talking about maybe Singapore or more conservative countries, right? Um, and it, it's a bit of a struggle sometimes because at the start when I was still kind of figuring out what I am also by myself, <laughs> it was uh, it almost felt like a, uh, a rejection. So it felt like I was being almost rejected for being uh, this person or being uh, this type of person, you know? Um, and I've had several speaking engagements, I guess, when, when, um, when I'm talking about my Paralympic journey and being a disabled athlete, um, they would spe specify not to mention anything to do with LGBT rights or issues. And I think at that point, I was still oblivious, blur, and like just, okay, fine, you know, that's fine. But, you know, mm -hmm. as I, I grow older and, and kind of uh, understand more of the world, I think that just, just shows how it, it's just hurtful, right? It's just harmful and... and not right, you know. So it's uh, as I as, as I've gone along, I have uh, then changed my my decision on only speaking about everything about myself. I will give you my full self and not just part of me, because I think that's the only way I can fully um, show the true self, right? True, my true self, and I think that's something I want for everybody to have to be able to be their true selves and to be able to be unafraid of being who they are, you know. So, yeah, as, as much as I can, I think I want to be able to show that, um, represent myself in the truest form. Um, and for everyone around, whether you're a boss or employee, employee or organization, to be able to en en enable that to happen. And that, that's that's key to what we're trying to do at the, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee at Bridgetram, is, is really making sure everyone has their, their true self they can bring it to their work. They can bring it to their teams, and, and they perform at the, the best level. And I, I think when you when you bring your true self to, to work or, or your your goals, you you do perform at a, at a higher level. So uh, I hope we're able to do that across across the uh, across the activities that we do um, as well. So, but thank you for for sharing that, Teresa. Um, finally, I think we, I just want to 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 ask the, the group. What 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 um what do, what would are you looking for from us? What what what's key for, for the audience today? What are you what would you like us to take away um from from the conversation? Uh, what maybe I can start with Pen, Pen Shui. What 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 do you think is key for us to to learn from from you and from your from the conversations? Um, this one's a toughie because there's, <laughs> not, <laughs> but I think um one thing maybe is to, to see that um, what para-athletes go through and what able-bodied athletes go through are rather similar. So just because of the disability um, and the differences, there shouldn't be any less importance placed on it. I think it's also interesting. It's nice to watch para-sports and I think um, give it a chance and uh, support it a bit more and, and you might have a new hobby. <laughs> Excellent. I'm sure we, you've got a whole bunch of new supporters here from from the audience. So, I think I think we'll definitely be taking that away, and we'll certainly have some very strong supporters from the uh, from the Britram community. And, and and Teresa, how about you? What are, what are some of the things? Mm, I think if there's one thing that I would like people to take away from today is. Um, As Pink Sin said, it's so tif this, this is difficult. <laughs> um, I think there's, there's so much to take away. I think whether it's Kim's experience or our ex personal experiences on our journeys, I don't think there's one thing that one thing that, that, that people should take away. I think if there's something that resonates, write it down <laughs> because you might forget. <laughs> uh, I would forget. Uh, I think whatever you, you take away from today, I would say... Um, put it somewhere, uh, refer it to it once once in a while, remind yourself why, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I think it's always important to have a um, a goal, right? And to, and to know why you, you know, to have this drive on why you are doing something in your life. I think yeah. something that I, I, I try to live by is to make sure that I live life as fulfilled as possible. Um, I don't want this life to be a wasted one. 
then I, I just want people to be able to do that in their own lives. Excellent, excellent messages. And that, that's you know, one of my personal takeaways is, is yeah, keeping your eye on the end goal and, and get as much out of life as, as, as you can. I think that's a, that's a key message. And, and, and Tim, what about you? Um, I, I'm going to recap on what everyone said. I'm going to summarise it in uh, one part of it and say, how can you be better tomorrow than you are today? It's everyone's individual responsibility, as, as things you said. It's no one else's. It's, it's yours. You own it. You own your life. Same as Teresa's just said, it's your life. Make the most of it. So you're going to enjoy it a lot more if you work on that principle. How are you going to do that? How are you going to be better tomorrow than you are today? In whatever line it is, a hobby, work, just you as a person. Uh, and then once you get your head around that, you're going to enjoy life a lot more. And you'll have a whole load of people around you, just as these athletes have in teams, families, uh, experts, coaches, you, everyone has a team around them. Just identify who's in your team. And I think we made the comment earlier, surround yourself with good people. It's extremely demoralizing if you have a series of negative people around you. You may be forced to be with some negative people, but you can choose to have the minimal time with them and choose your people around you wisely. They're your team, they're your support network, and you'll be required to support them as well. And what a great thing you can do for them. Uh, so I think the takeaway is, yeah, you're in control. You can control your attitude and how you behave to everything around you, even though you can't control what happens to you or other people's behavior. And it's this feeling of control, actually, that we've found helps people deal with stress and become more resilient. Once, once you realize you are in control, some of those stresses that are affecting people disappear because you are totally in control of how you react to it. So plan for it. Get your team around you and work out how you're going to maximise the opportunities you have in your life, just as you've seen from these two fantastic athletes. Yeah, I agree. Truly inspiring. And there's some some great takeaways there. Thank, thank you. Um, that, that really concludes the conversation that I wanted to, to have with, with the three of you. So, so thank you for sharing all those stories. But we, we do have some time for some, some Q&A from the audience. Um, and we've got a couple in the Q&A box, but please... Do add any more Q and A from the audience that, that you have. Anything you want to ask the, the panelists? So we'll, we've got a few minutes to, to cover more questions. Well, one question that's come up that I thought would be interesting to, to ask Teresa and, and Pentry: How do you reward yourself after a good race? Uh, I know, I know, PX, you, you've just come back from Germany and, and a whole bunch of uh, races that you, you've you've been through. So, what, what's your reward from from that? How do we reward ourselves after you know, like, <laughs> a good race <laughs> or a gold medal? How do you reward yourself after a gold medal? That's a... Okay, I do remember after the Paralympics, <laughs> right? It's always um because the Games Village there's McDonald's, so there's always McDonald's after the Paralympics. <laughs> it's generally just a uh, something small, a good meal, a good sleep, just some time. <laughs> Tim is nothing all this down. <laughs> it's not it's not our fault. It's not our fault that they have McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, basically like something that we can't do while we're racing, just to like you know, it's it's really more of a significance thing. It's like to mark the end of something. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like a and specific Teresa, thing. When you yeah, got your world records, when what did you do with your when you got your world record times in, in the in the, the 50 and the 200 meter breaststroke. Is it champagne? Or the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't really do anything to celebrate. Like to me, the world records weren't uh, end really goal. significant. Like it was not, yeah, it was not the end goal. It was just a, a progress, pro uh, a step, right? A step in the right direction. So the only time we really kind of uh, celebrated was at the end of the games or yeah, at the end of the games. Um, and it's not our yeah. fault they have McDonald's in the game. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we go for holidays, treat yeah. ourselves. You know, it's yeah. really anything to mong the end of, yeah. uh, of our journey. It's, it's not a specific thing. Yeah. So we, we went to Iceland after Rio. We just, uh, that was our treat to ourselves. Was that after Rio? No, after World Champs in 2019. <laughs> oh, Rio. After Rio, we went somewhere else. Uh, I think okay. I went to Lon London, right? Yeah, I went to London. So 
It depends. Sometimes it's a meal. Sometimes it's a trip. Sometimes it's just a really yeah. long sleep. Yes, a really <laughs> long sleep. <laughs> just do do something that you you haven't done for a long time. Reward yourself that way, and eat eat junk food. That's the that's the takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> The, the next question we've got on the on the board uh, and maybe tim this is one for you um the questions about support there's clearly a lot of support for uh, for athletes going through international competitions but what kind of support is available for emerging or developing para paralympic athletes yeah it's a good question around the world it's the same actually and we we referred to it earlier as an athlete progresses and gets better and better it's, it, the system rewards them because they've earned the right to having more services. So we, we said, spoke about this earlier, it is chicken and egg, because um, let me tell you how SDSC, Singapore Sports Development Council works. It's been in existence since 1973. The government funds Sports Singapore and some of that money comes over to every national sports association, including, including ourselves. We're a national sports association. That money is is used for those on the pathway, if you like, who, you know, are really going places. And my job is to help get the best out of them and increase that opportunity and increase the support. But we also have other fundraising efforts. And um, I would say there's an opportunity there when you asked earlier about what, what can be done, what can you do, what can the audience do? There is opportunities for volunteering with SDSC. And it might be volunteering time with a skill that you have it may be people in the audience have a skill that would really help uh, it may be we have people who have this expertise that can contribute in some way so i'm just going to put that one out there volunteering for sdsc in whatever skill you have please consider it and contact and we're one of many disabled organizations but this one's for sport and it's been around a long time so we get a mix of funding so we also fund grassroots and we also work with other government agencies, other departments, sport cares, for instance, to get the ball rolling for people to enjoy sport for the first time. And now academies and clubs are opening up to people with disabilities for the next level up. There's more opportunities. And then we also come in for Pathway and Performance to look for those potential athletes who have earned the right to have that higher level of support. But it's as we said before, you have to really take ownership, find those resources, and as you're on the journey, we're very happy to offer some support and advice to find out where you can get it and point you in the right direction. The higher up you go, once you prove that you are on the pathway and can become a, a, a represent Singapore well, then those services are available and increasingly so. So we are working on that to try and expand it. The good question. It's the same the world over, that package works. Yeah. It certainly sounds like things are developing and, and a lot better than in the early days that we, we've heard about from uh, from from the the, the other panelists. But, yeah. The 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 other question we've got is is about motivation during tough times. Um, and, and Teresa and Pentry, this is probably for you. How, how do you um, how do you motivate yourselves? Is it is is it winning that is the, the key for you? Is it is it leaving a legacy um, that's key? Or is it something else? Um, what, what, what kept you going during those tough times? I think I, I typed the answer in because I wasn't sure if we would have time. Ah. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, I'll just repeat it a little quick, quickly. <laughs> um, to me, it's really depending on your end goal. Like I think whether it's the end of a project for people in, in, in companies, whether it's uh, for, for us, whether it's the end of a competition, whether it's getting the medal at the end of a competition, whether it's uh, getting a good timing at the end of a competition, you have to know what your end goal is and to remember your, why you're doing this. So I remember uh, in the past, I have told myself things like, if you're like, especially when I'm really tired um, and if I don't want to go for this, comp this training session, I, I remind myself that, you know, your competitors are training right now. They yeah. are going to train and they're going to get faster than you, you know, if you don't go now. <laughs> um, and and then I'll be okay. Again. Then you have to find that little bit of motivation that's inside of you because like at the like earlier when I said you have to want to do this, I think that sets the, the bar for how, for doing something, right? If you don't want to do something, it's going to be really, really difficult to motivate yourself <laughs> to try and get out of that um, kind of tough space, right? So the first thing is to want to do it um, and then remember why you're doing it. 
and to remind yourself, especially if it's a competition, um, that there are people who are trying to get better than you. And if you want to be on top of your game, you have to keep going. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and that, that applies to all of us in life, I think. That's a, that's a great, great lesson there. Pintre, is it the same for you? Pretty similar. Are you looking to, to leave a legacy? <laughs> uh, I, I think for me it's pretty similar, but um, also I've always um, been motivated by, uh, especially in the recent years, by intrinsic. Um, it, 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 it's just been very intrinsic. It's just been something I want to do because I want to be faster. I want my times to be better. So these things are very tangible um numbers are very tangible uh and i think as a swimmer it's easier because the numbers don't lie so it's easier to continue pushing myself um and knowing that i've improved and just the sense of satisfaction i get from having better times is really really nice so in everything i do in life i know that i'm my biggest competitor and i just need to do better than what i did yesterday yeah. Okay, not yesterday, maybe like a year ago. Yesterday yeah. is a too much competition. Yeah. It, it, it's taking ownership and it's, it's, as Tim said, it's being better today than you were, to, were yesterday, really slowly developing over, over time. Fantastic. Well, we've, we've come up to the hour on the conversation. I've, I've, I think that's all the questions that we've, we've had from the audience, so, but an amazing conversation. Thank you to, to all the panellists, to Teresa, to, to Peng Shui and, and to Tim. For all your insights, we, we've covered so many different topics. Um, I, I think it's been a, a fascinating conversation and re really inspiring for, for me personally. I know the audience have also found it very, very inspiring. So thank you for, for sharing um, all your stories uh, and being so open with us. Um, in terms of um, other events, the British Chamber of Commerce, we, we have other events coming. Um, we're going to put those on the screen now. So please do uh, keep an eye out for those and, and register for any that are of interest. Um, there's a session on decarbonizing your organization. Uh, there's a session on cybersecurity. Um, and then finally, we, we've got a session with uh, Dr. Tan Si Ling, uh, Minister of Manpower um, at the AGM uh, later this month. So please keep an eye open for, for all those events. Uh, we, we do have a feedback feedback form. Uh, it's really important to us to, to get your feedback. So, so please, to all the audience, if you can take spend some time, give us feedback on, on the session today. Give us feedback on what you'd like to see from the Diversity and Inclusion Committee going forward. Any other topics you, you'd like us to, to cover and, and focus on uh, for the remainder of, of the year. That, it's always great to, to hear your, your feedback on, on the events. And on that note, I'll, I'll just say a huge thank you once again. Thank you to Teresa, Penchui, to Tim. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you to the audience for, for dialing in and, and for all your questions. Um, thank you, big mention out, big big mention to Dan Brown at, at Dulledge who, who organized today's event. So thank you for, for putting that together. And thank you to the chamber staff for, for all your, your uh, help uh, putting everything together today and, and advertising it and, and the whole logistics behind the event. So, so thank you, everyone. And we'll see you at the next event.